Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of, I was going to say the Beyond Resilience Life, but that's not this one, it's Licensed Psychologist. Now what? I am doing four parts of telling the story of becoming a psychologist, and today is part two, which is all going to focus on the theme of undergrad and grad school. So let's shall begin. <sighs> hmm. So I'm going to start with how I ended last time, which was about making the decision of putting all those gifts that I felt were inherited into place, meaning putting like studying psychology, meaning that. And I ended up going to, uh, I was accepted at the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras Campus for a bachelor degree in psychology. I, if you remember from the first part, I was born and raised more on the East Coast in a smaller town, and now I was going to start school in the capital in San Juan, technically Rio Piedras, but that's part of San Juan. And I was going to move out of my house. That in itself was a whole experience. The campus in Rio Piedras is beautiful. Yes, there's a lot of things. <laughs> Some classrooms has um, mold in their windows and, and all those kind of stuff. But the campus in itself, it's gorgeous. And it's also one, it, it houses some of the most, in my opinion, intelligent, deep, thoughtful people. It was an amazing experience. To this day, I still consider it as my alma mater, um, the, you know, my, the school that really formed me of who I am today. More than, I would say, grad school, if I'm going to be honest here, which I am. So the campus Rio Piedras, it's, it's plush, it's nature, it's beautiful, all those kind of things. And over there, I was able to experience some of the most amazing professors, some of the most challenging professors, some of the hardest classes, the more questioning. And I love my experience. I studied there. Technically, I started in the campus in Umacao. That's another story that I'm not necessarily going to share here about it. And then I went straight, you know, to the main campus in Rio Piedras. So I was there from 2001 to 2004. That's when I graduated my undergrad. Over there, I feel like one of the first things that I was learning to kind of about me and reclaiming was my inner curiosity and questioning everything. I think it was one of the first times that I was in a place that welcomed it. So what I mean with that is, if you remember, I if I mentioned this, I studied in first with um, Catholic sisters, with monjas, and then for elementary. And then I went to a monastery that had a high school and a middle school combined with monks. So my whole education was within the Catholic school education. And there's just limitations of what is accepted to question when you're in a religious setting and that's part of your school. Even though, and I'm going to talk more about my middle and high school, did prepare a lot of people to have their own thoughts and, and thinking. It still was very much of like, this is the way and we have to go to um, masses and, and, and stuff like that. So there still was a, a lot of that sense of shame, if you would think differently. And it was not necessarily welcome. And in my house, every you know, my father and, and my family, my nuclear family was also Catholic and would go to mass. You know, I did my first communion. Then I did the confirmation, all those kind of steps that are part of the Catholic religion. So when I went to that campus in Rio Piedras, and I was in a place that not only allowed it, but foster that curiosity, that questioning things, that it was even safe to question things. It was like I was in a room with lots of candy. It was so amazing. If you know, if, if I love candy, um, 
what I mean with that is baking goods. I'm I'm not into like like lollipops and stuff like that. That doesn't that doesn't light me up. But it was a full room with like baking goods, cakes and and chocolate and brownies, you know, from that perspective. And it was allowed, it was it was it was fostered. So that's one of the first things that I it took a little bit, you know, at the beginning, the transition to me feel safe enough to question things. But I love how a lot of the classes encourage us to create our own perspective, to question everything, and to get into our own conclusions. I even took a class, one of the class in humanistic. I, I think I kind of um, remember the professor's name, Mr. Villanueva. I think it was Villarreal or Villanueva right now. But part of the class exercises were teaching us about problem solving and helping us create, you know, different, um, write papers and stuff, put in different perspectives and like using arguments to go into the pros and cons of each of those. And so we could develop critical thinking. I remember loving that class another of the project in that class was going to different schools in Puerto Rico like high school public schools and analyzing how you know the part of it the colonialism and all that was embedded into it looked like a jail system and and so bringing back that critical thinking of questioning things that I would take for granted during that time, I also um, joined part of the protests to get away the Marina from Vieques, which is the military had um, like a, you know, they, a place that they would practice their use and their weapons and all that in Vieques, which is an island that I grew up seeing from my house. And that was, you know, that's where La Marina is. And that started, that movement started to get the Marina out of Vieques to bring back that land to the people that lives there and make it livable because with all those testings and the bombs that they were throwing on the chemicals and all that, it was becoming a very toxic place. It was already a toxic place. And I remember going to those protests and being like, wow, like we're protesting to get this. And it was those first time that I was questioning this is so weird. I'm a U.S. citizen and I live here. And at the same time, there's all these negative things that that the oppressor has placed in us. And it was the first time that I was starting to explore that because during my, you know, schooling years, I would say only in 10th grade, I think it was 10th grade, I had a history teacher that um, she was part of the um, green um Gosh, the, um, she was pro-independence of Puerto Rico. Let's just put it that way. And she started those seeds. But I was still like 10th grader in my Catholic school, not questioning. But in my undergrad years, those four years, I was exposed to more readings about the negative implications of... U.S. taking over Puerto Rico and also changing the narratives that it was not like we were we welcomed it because that was part of the history books when I grew up to be honest it was like oh the U.S. saved us kind of way and when I went to that undergrad program in La Universidad de Puerto Rico then he started like questioning those narratives did we welcome them did they take over because those things are so important because they impact what has been internalized I also learned way more about the people that started to stand up against them, how they were silent, skilled, and all of that. So a lot of the history that I learned throughout my whole life, I was starting to be like, hmm, this was not complete the truth. And there's many other perspectives. And what is my perspective on it? You know, I'm, I'm seeing all this different perspective. What is my perspective? And it's something that I feel... Right now, as we're going with everything that we're going, as I'm talking about this, it is another moment in life that we're being placed to question things and not take them for granted. It's just been too much polarizing with everything going on in our world in 2021. So I feel like, you know, as I'm saying this, it's also kind of like really touching me 
to remember that that's who I am and that's part of me. And I really enjoy when I do that, when I don't just take things for granted, when I like to use critical thinking before making a decision and it's a working decision, it could change at any moment. So yes, that's what I reclaimed when I went there. Something else that I reclaimed while I was in La Universidad de Puerto Rico was my love for arts, movement, and expressive arts. And I know I kind of mentioned that I used to dance and all that, but when I was there, I took some of my electives. I took one in, um, it was a pantomime class. I did not know it was a pantomime class because the title was like fancy and I thought it was about, you know, expression when you're dancing or something. And it was literally pantomime. And I loved, loved, loved that class. It was like one of the most amazing experiences ever. Okay, I guess I'm back. <laughs> Sorry for that interruption. So yeah, so I reclaimed that love for arts, movement and expressive arts. And I know I kind of mentioned that I used to dance and all that kind of stuff. But in my undergrad classes, that I did in, in the electives in that pantomime class, I had to like recreate plays. I had to recreate different things that I kind of, you know, for my imagination. And it was so nurturing to me. I also then took a class that it was my favorite. I took two classes at my last year. One was on humanism and the other one was on Teoría de la Creación Espiritual de la expresión creadora. So it was like, I'm going to translate kind of, um, creación, expresión. So that it, it was about creative expression theory, something like that. That was the class. Basically, it was integrating expressive arts in healing. And the other one was just about humanistic therapy. Those two classes were my last year. And I feel like they were like, we say, la gota. La, la última gota, like the last drop that I needed to kind of like come back into what I really like. And in those classes, I had to do, we had to journal, we had to like talk about our dreams, we had to write a story, and then we had to act it and do in a great drama, color, and use that as a way to go back to our finding who we are. I felt like doing that semester, I grew up as a person so significantly. It was like a huge shift that happened during that personal growth. And the insights I got about myself, about what I wanted, whew, the, it was so healing. It was a class, but it was so healing. And I think I still remember the professor I link over. It was amazing. And then the humanistic theories class also brought back what I really believe because my school, the psychology program was mostly like psychodynamic or psychoanalytic. So a lot of it was based on, you know, Freud and Lacan and all these theories that in a way had a little bit of a taste of pessimism and like determinism about you got that and that's what it is kind of way. And then the humanistic umbrella would bring more about the human potential and um, the purpose in life and, and finding that other side that I resonate way more than just being like from a deterministic perspective. And I'm saying that this was my own interpretation. Probably if you're listening and you're into psychoanalysis or psychodynamic, you might say that's not what it is. And that's, you know, that's all good. That was my perspective when I was taking all those classes and reading all the different papers that I had to read on Freud's writing or any other psychoanalyst writings and Lacan and all of that I felt in a way it, it, it was really cool to kind of see how you get to those perspectives but at the same time it was very deterministic it was like we were basically all screwed because of our moms and <laughs> that was like a very generalized but then the humanistic would bring that aspect of the human is a good person innately. And I like that more. That resonates more with me than the human is just like succumb to their desires and all that from a psychoanalyst, a psychodynamic perspective that I was getting taught on. 
So during that time, it was like, wow, there's this other new perspective that is not CBT, <laughs> that is not like things are determined, but more about that depth into human as who we are, what we came here to do, what is our purpose and, and all those kind of things. So that also really helped me to be like, that's what I like. And yes, it was amazing. Then something else that I think it's kind of important that I share about this is during this years, I experienced my first touches of failure as an adult. And I'm going to share some of those and the lessons because I think especially it's been more than 10 years that, that now I can definitely see the lessons in the moment probably I didn't but now I can so the first ones that I'll share is when I was in undergrad my school was very research oriented and a lot of my peers were part of those research programs and there were this kind of internships that you can apply and I applied to so many like research internships, mostly in the U.S., and I did not get accepted to, and this was like undergrad, I did not get accepted to any. And I remember every year being like, huh, like what's going on? And one of the things was it, I feel like it helped me with improving my writing, improving also like starting that failure muscle, if you want to call it, like getting comfortable to receiving no's and learning from those disappointments. And that also built my determination muscle because whenever I would get a no, instead of just being like, I will never apply again, that's it. You know, I would go like, okay, how can I improve this? How can I do it in the next time so I will get in it? And then the other thing was when I was applying for, um, when I was in undergrad, I applied to grad school. My sister was graduating high school and she was going to go to study in, in Fort Lauderdale, um, digital media production over there. And there was a school there that I was very, very interested, Nova Institute, something like that. And I applied and it was my number one, but part of it, it was convenient. I mean, I applied to other schools in Atlanta and other places that probably would, they gave me, you know, they gave me offers and all that. But that school, Nova, was the one that I really, really wanted. And it was that vision of moving with my sister and all this kind of stuff. The school, something that I think is important, the focus more was more psychodynamic, and I applied there before taking the humanistic and the expressive arts class that I mentioned. So I was like, I mean, I like to draw from psychodynamic to explain things and patterns. I think it's so spot on. And I know right now with the whole evidence base, it might be like, well, that's not it. But during that time from the theories, I felt like it was the one that provided more depth and an understanding of the human experience. And so I applied to that school. And then I had that shift when I took those classes, the humanistic and expressive arts class that semester, and I, I already had applied, that I was like, whoa, is that what I want? Like, I want something different. And I did not get in. Initially, that was so, so hard. I even went to like our orientation there and stuff. It was It was so hard because it was the first time that I put all my eggs in one plate and they kind of dropped, if we want to say. And I went through a lot of questioning because the internship, I just I just cared but didn't care. But that was the first thing that I really, really, really felt like I wanted it and it didn't happen. So at the beginning, it was that time of dealing with grief. Like, What am I going to do? Am I going to go to grad school? Am I going to continue in this profession? Do I want to go to something else? I went to a little bit of an existential crisis during that moment. And I remember I had the professor from the humanistic course. And I think his last name was Delgado. And I would talk to him a lot like, oh my God, I don't know if I should continue this path or if I should go to a different. It, it impacted me so much that I did feel like if they did not accept me there, then maybe that was not my path to continue in psychology. 
now that I look back, I'm like, oh, wow. But yes, I had that. And I remember during that time, I also had a lot of physical symptoms. My stomach issues came back with vengeance and I was dealing with a lot. I remember being like back and forth, back and forth. He was such a good mentor. And during that time, he was Lidiana, if you're going to stay and you want to study, like you have several options. You have the University of Puerto Rico or you can also go private. And even though I love the University of Puerto Rico, there's a lot of challenges studying there because if there's any protests or something, then the school shuts down and then you can get, you know, behind and, and all this kind of stuff. And I did, even though I knew I wanted a doctorate or I kind of was exploring the options, I did not want it to stay there forever. The other thing is that the University of Puerto Rico, you know, there were some pieces that felt like unsafe being there at night, you know, and all those kind of stuff. So I decided with his recommendation to go to La Universidad Interamericana, which it was a university that he kind of recommended because a lot of the professors that were also in the Universidad de Puerto Rico were there or they were like they graduated from the Universidad of Puerto Rico. So that's what I ended up doing. And now as I look back, I'm so happy that I was not accepted to NOVA because it was more of psychodynamic. And now as I'm working with a lot of people that have gone through graduate programs in the U.S., first of all, it would have been way more money. (laughs) Second of all, I would have experienced a lot of more of discrimination early on in my career and one of the things I, by studying in Puerto Rico is I kept being like in my little container, in my little safe place, that I was not being necessarily discriminated or experiencing that directly oppression. So that was kind of helpful in a way. And the third one was when I was applying for internship, pre-doctoral internship, I also got no's from all the 15 like about 13 places that I applied. And then I had to go through a clearinghouse. And I know this is not the first time I'm sharing this story in case you've listened to the Beyond Resilience Life. So that in itself was such a hard process, but the lesson was determination and grit. It really solidified my intention and it gave me the opportunity that when you work I don't I don't like using the word, but you know, when you work towards something I was gonna say hard you can get it if you keep on trying. And and that experience helped me because later in life, as I'm struggling with things, I always go back to like that moment. I did not get it. And I kept working hard. I kept using, you know, all the things that I learned through manifestation, the power of the mind and hard work and all of that. And I was able to get something. So it just it's one of those things that whenever I feel like oh, I cannot make it in life, it's, oh, I did that. And that helped me. So I'm so happy in a way that that happened because it really helped me for and prepared me for later on. And so now as I'm talking about grad school, let's go back there. In grad school, I went to the Universidad Interamericana, like I mentioned, and over there, I felt like some of the things that I reclaim, number one, was my voice and arguments. I was able to kind of like continue practicing expressing myself through the research papers and and the, um, you know, that I had to do for the assignments, for the presentations, and put in practice all those things that I learned in undergrad about critical thinking, especially as I'm was learning how to conceptualize cases, how to understand someone and including not only what they came with, what's going on in their life, diagnosing, all those things I felt like flew or flowed easily for me because of my back, you know, really good um, back, not back, but like experience with critical thinking and, and, and exploring all different points of view. It also helped me that when I was having to do those conceptualization or work with clients when I started my practica, that I was integrating different things, 
different perspectives and not just only doing one theory, but also questioning what pieces of that theory is going to be helpful for the client and what pieces are not from the get go. I also integrated arts and stuff in my interventions. I remember I had a client during one of my first practicums and we used drawing and it was the most amazing. It was a client that um, we used, um, she was going through like difficulties in understanding her life and I guided her to like a guided meditation and she drew something and later on we worked with that image and that was so beautiful and I loved it because I was able to integrate all that creativity that I kind of solidified in my undergrad. And lastly, I also reclaim my love to be a speaker. During grad school, you have to do also in undergrad, but in grad school, I felt like I had to do way more presentations, class presentations, and work in group and all that kind of stuff, not only for my classes, but also later on when I was doing practicums. And that part really helped me. I also worked, you know, I had a lot of side hustles and and different jobs. And one of them was creating presentations for a a company and presenting them. So that part, I reclaimed that love of speaking that and those practices that helped me to be here and to create this podcast today. So that's a little bit about the things that I reclaimed during my education in the field for the next episode, then I'm going to go more into pre-doctoral internship and getting licensed. And we'll keep this discussion. Thank you so much for joining. And until then, one thing that I wanted to share is that um, an announcement is that I have a program that is launching in the fall. And it's a mentorship program to help psychotherapists become the therapists that they wanted to and the business owners that they intended and envisioned by reclaiming their own authenticity, intuition, and inherited gifts that probably throughout their lives, throughout their formation as a psychotherapist, were taken by the oppressive systems and the whole internalized oppression and way more factors. And that program is going to start in October. To learn more about it and to apply for a discovery call, which is part of the application, please follow the link here in in the in this podcast. And thank you so much for listening. Bye.